So we spent uh, from uh, 10 o'clock last night to, uh, to 12.30 today, overnight here, drinking hot cocoa and talking about, um, talking about Bernie Sanders. And there's a lot to be said about him. Um, and, and before we left the show, Marty made a very, very clear point about, um, about Bernie Sanders and his position on guns. And uh, that's one of the things that I like most about him is his position on guns. He understands that there's, there's this divide, this chasm on the gun issue. Yes. And there seems to be very little in the center. There's very little being spoken about what, what binds us together as a nation on guns. But Bernie understands pretty clearly that coming from a state in the state like Vermont, which is a very rural state, it's a, it's a hunting state, it's a, it's a fishing state, people have guns. It's rural. Yeah. And he understands that that's, uh, that's part of the culture. And it's to be understood, it's to be expected, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal. On the other hand, however, in a city where you don't have things to hunt other than other human beings, guns are a very bad thing to have. Mm. And guns should and could and should be Just out of curiosity, what do you think is the rate of uh, gun murders in a city like Chicago? Chicago's one of the higher ones, as I recall. How many gun uh, stores are there in Chicago where you can buy a gun over the counter? Probably none. Okay. What do you think the murder rate is in you with gun violence in a city like Houston, Texas? Well, Texas as a state has the most gun violence. I don't know if Houston does, though. Okay. Uh, would you say it's lower than Chicago? I, I think it is, just for discussion purposes. Well, I'm going to make the comparison that they're both cities. They're both large cities. So I would expect that probably... It, it depends, and, and you, what you didn't get to is where the guns come from Okay, in Chicago. which is another point, because how many from? gun stores do you think there are in Houston, Texas? And I'll tell you, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. But so this concept that if we have fewer guns and we control the guns, that we're going to limit gun violence has been proven again and again to be a fallacious argument. But what you just, so Bernie Sanders but what you just made was has, a, has said, a has, has got it just right. But what you just made was a fallacious argument because the, the guns that come into Chicago, obviously they're not coming in through legitimate gun salespeople in mm. Chicago. They come from gun shows. How do they get purchased at gun shows? Well, you really don't need to show any proof of identity. Mm-hmm. You really don't need to show anything. And what, what and, um, and, and capitalism is a great system, but there's some ugly sides to it. There's some, when greed gets involved in capitalism and, and you have this uber exuberant capitalism, some bad things can happen. And what people do in order to make a fast buck is they'll go to a gun show and they'll buy a bunch of guns and nobody asks any questions about what they're going to use them for. So then why in the world they're, would Bernie Sanders they're bringing, they're bringing be in them. favor of people legitimately exercising their Second Amendment rights to have and bear arms? Why would he do that? Doesn't he understand that these guns that are purchased in rural Vermont make them way to the south side of Chicago and shoot people? It's terrible. No, actually, it's Pennsylvania is, is the key point of reference for uh, people going to gun shows. I, and buying I think large just Bernie's amounts. got it wrong. We need to control guns, and that way, no one would there wouldn't be violence in minority communities. God, I love it when you're sarcastic. Ugh, I love Bernie, it when, God, Bernie. I love it when you're sarcastic. When you talk, when you talk dirty, sarcastic. Um, Bernie, Bernie Sanders is a big supporter of the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. But he also understands that there's 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 two settings in America, and of course, this is a suburban. But you just yeah. said there's suburban that areas the in people between. in Chicago, where there's no gun rights, there's there's unbelievable restrictions on guns. Can't sell guns, can't have guns, can't do anything, can't have a carry permit, can't have everything. everyone's being gunned down left and right. Every, and you just got well, done saying well, it's because all, people buy them. In gun shows, like in rural Mer- Vermont, where uh, uh, Bernie Sanders is. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. hey, hey. hey. You know, talking on your phone in the uh, restaurant. <laughs> um, I think you missed my point. I think I made your point. You no, know, I think you missed my point is that the guns are bought elsewhere. Exactly. And uh, got bought elsewhere. They're bought at gun shows. There's Which sm- Bernie there's, supports. There's, no, no, he doesn't. He does oh, not support gun, gun. I thought he supports the uh, Second Amendment rights in rural communities where most of your gun shows he are. Does not, he, he does not support people's ability to buy guns without showing any form of identification. Oh, okay. But the NRA, but if you go back to 1994, mm-hmm. when we had this big discussion about it last time, well, one of our big discussions about guns, is that the, uh, the NRA was in favor of mandatory background checks. They were. Okay. They were. And they were right then. Now they're not, and they're wrong. Hmm. 
mandatory background check so somebody can't go to a gun show and then buy an armload of, uh, of high-powered weaponry, drive into Chicago and sell them, on, to sell them in the back alley to, to kids that are going to use them to kill each other. Mm. That's what's wrong with guns. Guns are not meant to be what in do you cities. Think? What do you, you don't think that uh, the lack of respect for law enforcement in some of these communities may lead to some of this gun violence? No, I think there's a lack of law, law enforcement amongst, well, amongst kids in general, amongst libertarians. And we're all a little bit, we're all a little bit, there's a little bit of anti-cop in all of us, except in me, of course. What about, I, who I'm, can remember the, absolutely, the, um, the image of the mother in mm, Baltimore mm, that found her son out with the rioters and everything in his ninja outfit, yeah. and she came and whooped up on him and yeah. you know got him back in line. Do you think that if we had some, uh, if the, there was a more robust economy where people had jobs, and, and, and if you think if there was more intact families, especially in the minority communities where there was discipline laid down, We've had a, a little bit less of this outrage against uh, police like we've seen that have ended in the, the, the uh, assassination of two policemen in, in New York City and the so, shooting of a Ferguson cop who still has the bullet in his neck. It sounds like, it sounds like you're implying, at least, that, that a family needs, needs a man, needs a husband in order to have discipline. I would say that an ideal setting to raise a child, especially an adolescent young man, say from the ages of mm. 10 through 18, mm-hmm. is it's very, very helpful to have a father in the house, I think it's both helpful. modeling masculinity and providing uh, uh, some form of control and parental control. I think, I think are, it's absolutely ideal. I think women are capable of that, too, but, um, but that's, you know... Obviously, the more parents, the better. That was, that was the point of um, your good friend Hillary Clinton's remark about it takes a village, is that if you've got an extended family involved in raising a child, mm-hmm. the more, if you've got grandparents involved, you've got two parents, you have grandparents involved, you have uncles, you have aunts, you have all these role models. The more role models you have, the better and the, more, the easier it is to raise a, a productive, clear-thinking Citizen out of a kid. Well, I think well, you agree with her on that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's it's good to have a village raise a child. I also think it's good to have a mom and a dad. Let Ooh. me just go down a short list. Part of the village. Incarceration levels, mm. advanced education levels, mm. unemployment levels, um, uh, um, and, and ending up uh, having uh, being bankrupt or broke or on uh, assistance. Mm. All of those things go up. Mm-hmm. When you have a one-parent family, and they go down when you have a two-parent family. In that's, other words, that's dollars. That's 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 sim- that's simple economics. I couldn't disagree with you more. I and this is getting into sort of the Christian worldview that I maybe I'm one of the last few people that adhere to that. Where in the Bible or it talks about, just, or maybe you're just possibly on the wrong side of Christianity. Okay, well let's go. Are, let's because go. There's, there's a rainbow of Christianity. Okay, let's, there are a lot of us liberal Christians, and well, in fact, in fact, we maybe we're not as vocal as as. Um, conservative Christians are, but we're, we're there. Okay. I, I've never heard a liberal uh, accused of being non-vocal. But be that as it may, I would say that in the Bible it talks about in, for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Mm-hmm. This is you know found in the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. It's been in, cold, in Western society for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. This concept of having a mother and a father, Mm -hmm. and they form a nuclear family. I would propose to you, and that list that I went down had nothing to do with economics. It had to do with having a mother and father, and that is, I believe, an ideal setting to raise a family. Now, 70% of minority families... Why would a nuclear family Hold on, I was in the middle of a point. Let me finish my point. Make it quick, because I'm jumping 70% of of, uh, minority families right now have one parent. Mm -hmm. One parent. So when things happen in, like, Ferguson and Baltimore and Mm -hmm. Incarceration rates and and uh, income inequality and mm-hmm. all of this. Yeah. All the liberal Democrats point to, oh, it's racism, it's racism, it's racism. Hold on, we have an African American in the White House in in Ferguson and, and in, in Baltimore right now. We have African American DAs, African American mayors, African American police, African American everything. Mm-hmm. And yet they won't focus on the point that we have a state that's a nanny state that provides everything from cradle to grave. So no longer the man bringing home a paycheck is sort of obsolete like Ozzy and Harriet. I don't understand and why, why you I don't understand why you disparage the term nanny. I mean this 
you know, the, the Nan, it was a good TV show, for at least I re- what I recall of it, the one episode that I watched. But um, why, why, is this, why is this notion of nanny such a bad thing? Do you want me to answer is, that? Isn't a nanny sort of like a grandmother or, 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 Do you want me to or, answer or that? a grandfather or aunt or uncle or mom or something like that? Do you want me to answer that? What's wrong with, with, with the term nannies, nanny? Nannies, and, and by the way, uh, for those of you watching at home, I didn't have nannies one. raise children. Mm-hmm. Children are not responsible for their behavior. They're not responsible for taking care of themselves. They crap in their pants and someone changes their diaper. Mm-hmm. The government is not your nanny and you are not a child. You have responsibility for your own life. That's why I hate the concept of a nanny state taking care of it. You are an independent free American, and you don't need the government to take care of you. So Johnny, Johnny and Joseph over at the table, they, I guess they were the ones you were pointing at. Lead me I back, don't know who lead, I was pointing at. Lead the me vast back, viewing audience. Lead me back, lead me back to, the, to the question of why, why cannot a nuclear family, why do you feel a nuclear family can't consist of two, two dads or two moms? Is there such a big, is there such a big to-do about, um, about two adults, two responsible adults that just happen to be but either wear wear pants or 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 wear something else or whatever you know you know what I mean. What, Go what, ahead. Why can't, no, uh, why, why look, can't it's, you, the, it's the law dads? of the land. The Supreme Court has judged. But that's, but, 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 and that, so be it. But but I, I want you to to continue on and talk about um, why is it that um, why is it that having two dads is a bad thing? I don't think there's anything particularly different about it than than having a dad and a mom? I would say that the ideal for raising uh, children is to have a mother and a father. I believe that the the man brings a certain skill set, and I believe the mother brings a certain skill set. And the blending of those two, ideally... Ideally, and I think the family structure is blown up in, in you yeah. know modern culture. But under ideal circumstances, I think that, e- and even then, it's a it's a bit of a crapshoot raising kids. If you've raised kids, you know what I'm talking about. Sure. But I think that that is an ideal setting uh, from which to uh, raise kids. And from my perspective as a Christian, so men are different. It, it for- coincides with my Christian worldview. So well, they from your conservative Christian worldview, because my Christian worldview and and the church I attend are. Are quite have, have a quite different worldview than, than that, um, but why what, there's something different between men and women, and I think biologically you're absolutely right. I mean that's pretty simple, that's easy to figure out. But um, why could there not be a man who relates better to the skill sets that are traditionally ascribed to women, and why why could there not be a, a woman or women that are more comfortable with the skill sets that are traditionally ascribed well, to, I, to men. Well, I, I, I think that there are. I think that there are men that are very sensitive and nurturing, and I think that... you got uh, two of them right here. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, got, I got, you know, and I have nothing but love from nurturing of my children, and, and it isn't like one's a Neanderthal and the other is, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, some sort of a nurturing person that you might think of that none comes to mind right now. But uh, mm. I think it's it's a blending of the two, and I think there, if, if nothing else, again, from my Christian point of view, I believe God created the world. Mm-hmm. And if nothing else, God loves diversity, and there are no two human beings that are exactly the same. And there are no two human beings that follow the exact same plan. And it especially isn't expressed in raising children. Well, you know, there's helicopter does, moms and there's live and let live. How does, how does God look on it? And, and I think we have a different viewpoint of this, a different answer to this. How does God look upon homosexuality? Well, okay, if you want to look at it from a biblical point of view, there's a few verses. One's found in Romans chapter 1, you can look it up. Others are found in Leviticus. And the general general view throughout the Old Testament of uh, reactions to homosexuality as it's manifested. And it's not a positive thing. On Mm. my TV show, we had a a gay pastor who was on. And we we went through some of the other texts. But if if you believe in God... Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, it, and then the next step is if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and and, and is is considered, you know, our our model, our our 
structure for how we're supposed to relate, say the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. These are codified in the Bible. Mm, but the Bible, so, the Bible itself, and, and even the Ten Commandments, is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Marty credit for this one because he threw this out at me a couple weeks ago in a, con, in a conversation, fungible, uh, manipulatable. You can decipher it different ways. You can, you can argue from, from either, any, or all perspectives for or against this. But the Bible, the Bible is, is very fungible. You can read a lot of things into the Bible. You can in, take many, many interpretations, even right on down to thou shalt not kill. Because in Hebrew there are, I think it's about 20 different uh, definitions, 20 different definitions of the word kill. Yeah, is it thou shalt not kill, or is it thou shalt not murder, is yeah. it in self-defense, is it okay, or isn't it? Yeah, and, in our, and in our courts of law there are, are clearly an entire rainbow of mm-hmm. different types of things that people can be accused of. Mm-hmm. Different types of homicide, different whether you, there's forethought of malice in, in, in the commission of a murder. Um, to me, it's all killing, and if somebody kills, they should never be allowed to be amongst society to, to repeat the offense. Because, because people, I believe that people are inherently good and inherently feel guilt when they do something as horrible as kill someone. So just out of curiosity, if in that train in, in Paris this mm. last week, and yeah. one of those military, those heroic guys, and by the way, salute those Americans out there that took down that uh, terrorist that was really They did sure a great everyone, job. If, per se, one of them had a knife or something mm. and killed that guy, in, mm. in this case they just beat the crap out of him and hogtied him, it was a beautiful picture yeah. in the end, um, uh, would you would have said that that man should not be among us in society ever again? Or would I you guess give there him has to medal? be an accountability there has to be a, a, an allowance for self-defense. Okay. And I think when someone's coming at you with a gun and you pull out a knife and stab them in self-defense, I guess that's, you know, I'll, I'll make an exception for that, certainly. Um, but I think the burden of proof is, is probably on the individual to show that, um, you know, which is not the way our, our justice system works. The person does not have to show any, any rationale for why they did anything, the full burden is on on the uh, the prosecution to to prove that they did what they did and that the charges are accurate. But the Bible itself is very very fungible and and very manipulatable, and there are a lot of different versions of the Bible. I mean, uh, if the Bible is the Word of God, why do we have the King James Version? We went through this on another show. The King James Version, the Revised Standard of ver- ver- Version. There's a, a whole Reinterpretation and re 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 reinterpretation of the Word of God. Actually, what you said isn't completely accurate. I mean, I don't know Flower how deep five. in the ways. You could add some. If you, there was something called the Dead Sea Scrolls, correct? Yeah. Which were which were archaeologically uh, uh, they were discovered uh, in and around the Middle East, and they they were papyri reeds that had actual copies of the scriptures that predated that dated the last. Um, uh, mm. Autograph of different passages of the Bible by five or six hundred years, and using science, we can determine that the verify yeah. basically the age of. And all so, these things. in yeah. other words, like you have the book, like Iliad, the Homer, you know, the Odyssey. Mm-hmm. Uh, there yeah. are no, there, there's not any evidence that that was actually written by that person, mm-hmm. and yet we recognize that as being right. true. If you look into the archaeological, just Google it. Everyone's got one of these now. Google it. Yeah, I can't even talk into my phone now. Yeah, but, but be archaeological careful, evidence. But be careful where you go because you have to always, always fact check, always question, always question anything and everything you read. Look for alternative possibilities. Weigh, consider, and and then draw your own conclusions. Never but if you Google anything, archaeological evidence for the authenticity of the scriptures, mm. and you come on to like the National Geographic's page or something mm. like that, you're on fairly safe ground there's, in saying something there. Fair, but my point is that um, yeah. time and time again, the historicity of the scriptures mm. have been confirmed by archaeological, by extra-biblical historical references, by findings in archaeology. Sure. The, the Dead Sea Scroll comes to mind, and there are others. So when this concept of, well, you know, the Bible, no one really knows what it says, everyone says it's, it's not so much it. The Ten Commandments, pretty solid. The fact that you are not an accident of a, cosmo, of a, a godless cosmos, the fact that in the beginning God created, pretty solid stuff. The foundations of marriage, 
For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the ordained structure of the family as found in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a debated issue. It isn't something gray. It isn't something fungible. It's a pillar of Judeo-Christian ethics for thousands and thousands of Mm -hmm. years. It just is. Okay. Point well made. Why in the world... You know, I, I get thinking about something, and it's, what the hell is this in my soup? I thought they were chips. I ate three, but then I realized that these are like uh, pieces of shells, so I got a tummy ache. Yeah, they're seashells, and, and it's as an aside to our, our good friend Candy, uh, Candy Timnev. Um, these, these are called, by people that walk along the seashore, they are called old men's toenails. Sorry, <laughs> you can call them whatever you want, but the commonly accepted for, term for, for these uh, things are, are old... And if you ever had, if you ever knew an old man and could see how toenails tend to yellow when you get to be in your 80s or 90s, and sometimes earlier, then, well, I lost my, I lost my point of reference. But, but, why, but, okay, why, why then, why then this, for lack of a better term to call it, I'll call it a war on science. Why, why can't science and theology coexist? Mm-hmm. Why can't why can't people that are that are theologians, people that that are that are extremely strong believers mm-hmm. in the Bible as being the Word of God, why do they have this battle against science? Because science says that the world is um, four four billionish years old, and not ten thousand as the Bible seems to make it out to be. And, and why can't why can't scientists be? And they are. Why can't they be? Quite often, very religious people. Why can't science and uh, and theology, whether it be from one of the three major world religions or, or from any other religions, why can't they they peacefully coexist and recognize each other and uh, and and not have this it, you or me mentality? Well, actually, I mean, you just said that many scientists are very strong people of faith. Uh, Albert Einstein himself sure. said that, you know, as he discovered uh, all the physics and the fundamentals of, of humanity, he, he said that there must have been some design that, you know, E equals MC sure. square and, and everything is so predictable in a sense that it's so repeatable. And that, yet, that and that's it, so it randomly, cry- and that's so randomly scattered and beautiful. Well, okay, it's randomly scattered and beautiful in the sense that no two snowflakes are exactly the same. I'll grant you that. But at the same time, when you look at it, just, just at our Earth here, and, and if, if the axis of the Earth were one, one degree more, we'd burn up. If mm-hmm. it was one, one degree, we would freeze. Um, when you look at the intricacies of your eye and an eyelash mm-hmm. and the fact that you can see it, you look at the intricacies of one DNA molecule. When you consider the fact that the rings around Saturn have a braid yeah. in them. Uh, Albert Einstein would say that, you know, there, there's, there's some design well, at work it, so in the best, universe. He didn't say it, so you better not give him too much credit. No, but. he wouldn't say that, I believe in the God of the Bible and Jesus is his son and he rose from the dead right. and the whole Mary thing is good and I'm down with Christmas. He didn't say that. But he did say that there is some design that's reflected in the universe. And that's uh, that's pretty cool. So I don't think that there is a it, it is, war it, between Christianity and cool. religion. And you said that you said that the Bible says that the world is ten thousand years old. That's, that's completely that's, not true. That's that's well, I don't know. I, I keep hearing from. I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I hear a lot of people claim that the Bible is is the Bible shows that the uh, you can go back through the generations and you can determine the age. I don't know if you're determining the ages of the of the of the Hebrew people. Or if you're determining the ages of the earth, you could probably make a, a good case for One, being just the age, of, just you, the history of the Jewish people. If you want to, if you want to have a mm. conflict, the Bible would claim mm. that the world. It, it's called the argument from design for the existence of God. Mm. The concept is that if you walk down a beach and you come across a watch and you look at a watch and you see that it's organized and balanced and repeatable and there seems to be some unity and structure to it, mm. it is not illogical to say. There must have been a watchmaker. So the concept is a watchmaker theory for the existence of God. That is eminently logical. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spock. But, um, yeah. Live long and prosper. Live. Hold on. Got it like that? Live long and prosper. We got it. Okay. Onward. So, um, 
So whether or not some people believe there is no God, and I guess that's I guess that's um, even people that don't believe, even people that are atheists and agnostics have a, have a core set of beliefs. Whether it revolves around the existence of God, they have a core set of beliefs, which really, in fact, is the greatest not, good for the not, greatest number of people. Not 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 really necessarily very different, and probably not different at all from the the core beliefs of people that consider themselves uh, uh, Christians, uh, Muslims, um, uh, uh, Jewish people. We're all pretty much we're all pretty much on the same page as far as. Um, as, as far as the uh, a, a core set of values, and there really isn't much difference that separates us on that. Well, I mean, when you get to the fundamental philosophy of people's worldviews, mm-hmm. it, it does make a difference. You know, if you believe that we're an accident of a, accident of a godless cosmos, and mm-hmm. that human value, human life, only has value in in its productive ability to society, uh, and and when when someone becomes unproductive, he is of no more value to society. That would war against human life at its most vulnerable point mm. in the womb and end of life issues. Where you have in Oregon uh, um, a lady who is, you know, on the Oregon government health plan, yeah. and she has cancer, and they say, well, the cancer medicine is seven thousand dollars. We're not going to pay for that, but we will pay for the fifty dollars worth of suicide medication mm. if you'd like to have government assisted suicide. This is an actual letter, an actual lady where the state has taken over. So when you have a situation where you're at the philosophical level of what is the value of life in these issues... We're going to have to, we're going to, have to wrap it up there. But we're going to transit back to the original question from, um, from uh, Wednesday night show, from last night's show, that, um, that, that we have this argument between uh, two sides on the abortion issue, and, and one side says that uh, the other side is anti-child, and the other side says the one child is anti-woman, and I'm not sure that either one, either perception is accurate. But um, all good talk and all good, uh, good for discussion uh, amongst yourselves, with your friends, neighbors. Keep the discussion respectable, but carry on the discussion and stop the video games. So this has been Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson, Marty Heiser, and... Uh, and have a, a wonderful rest of the week. And uh, Basil is on uh, Friday night at 10 a.m. And, and Sunday morning at 11, uh, Friday night at 10 p.m. And Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And then i got to bring uh, Donald Trump back to Basil because, uh, because Basil went about the world.